How about that? And if can everybody else would mute, that would be good. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> well, maybe by the time eight weeks are over, I'll have it down. <laughs> maybe. Well, welcome to the third of what I think is going to be eight sessions. Uh, we'll do some review and then I'll come back to these pictures. Uh, we're talking about a shroud, which is a little over 14 feet in length. As you see it from the feet around the head and back to the feet as a Hebrew burial device before they collected the bones after a year for the final burial. We are working on the first part of this equation is shroud man, whoever's in the shroud and put the image. By chance, does that happen to be Jesus of Nazareth that it relates to? And we are starting currently with the scientific method and we'll then move to evidential and so forth. We tried to clarify that there isn't anything that I can say in a presentation like this that will not have people object to parts of it. Um, I took the fact of Jesus being alive or something like that as an example, and we found, oh yeah, he's quite heavily documented. That's not a problem, but in print, on the web, all kinds of places, essentially everything that I say is objected to by someone. Uh, I think about Macron as <laughs> A prime example, he died several years ago. He's the one that thought it was a, an art fake. Um, his website still exists. Someone's paying to keep this thing live. So, you know, it, it, this is throughout all the stuff. The books exist, you can still buy them, they're still published and all that. We said we're going to spend four sessions on the scientific method. Then we're going to move to what you might call more historical. And then we're going to get to, shall we say, what might be considered a religious question. As of 2016, it seems that everything is turned either probably authentic or authentic in terms of the things we find in all three of the methods that we're going to be using. You remember, we then said that one of the things that we need to do as budding scientists, you guys in high school. <laughs> That's how I got into this thing, remember? As we start out, we try to figure out what are we seeing, agree on the shapes and all the colors and all that. And then finally, the last thing we do is try to interpret what we're seeing. So we're trying to be a little conservative here as how we get to our, our task. We're trying to eliminate our own biases too as we do this, because we all look at things our own rose-colored ways. We start building a list of conclusions. We don't necessarily have to see them put onto this list every time, but whether you're a scientist or whether you're a person who's trying to come up with an explanation of your own, things need to be accounted for. And if you're gonna fake it or if you're gonna prove it, either one, you've got to deal with this kind of listing of materials. And I think the current science ones are like 178 items. We had medical conclusions that we looked at. About, I think, 24 different uh, examiners have looked at the uh, shroud and essentially say he died mainly of asphyxiation. When they got to the point, he couldn't push himself up on his painful feet in order to exhaust the air from his lungs. We picked up the fact that if you were to look at end of a thread, from maybe 80 to 120 fibrils showing. The image is very, very minor on just one edge. We didn't know until 2002 that there's some cases it's on the back edge too with the whole white thread in the middle of it, which makes it even harder to try to explain. Of course, this was the major point. To you and me, this doesn't strike us as being the, the definitive thing, but when Sterp, the group of scientists went, they thought when they saw this picture, if you will, they would be ready to go home because they were sure that it would be a painting and they would find evidence down through the middle of paint. And though they tried after this point, uh, uh, they say a thousand different tests, they were unable to find anything to suggest 
paint had been applied. We talked about hypotheses as part of the work of a scientist, and we raised the fact that <laughs> so far, they've eliminated all the complete hypotheses that they've been able to come up with. And while we're going to talk later about some partial hypotheses, if you will, the thing we're struggling with now seemingly as a group is the issue of is a miracle somehow involved in this thing and what would that mean and how would you prove it and what would you do with it? As of 2000, before we knew about the image on the back side, the best they could come up with as a word was dematerialized to say that shroud man somehow left his shroud by a method we don't comprehend except in the movie Star Trek, we remember how they used to beam Scotty up moving from place to place. And so far, that's one of the better ways to envision the, where we are. We had, of course, various statistical approaches. The probabilistic model said it's absolutely 100% certain this has to be Jesus of Nazareth, even though all the negative findings were loaded into MathCAD 7 at the same time. We looked at several things as we were kind of ending. We found that there were flowers. We found that there were pollens, which gave some clue where this cloth had been. We found that there were coins based upon this image. There's artwork that seems to be based on this image. The wood was found on the shroud. It would make sense. The soil, but all these are pointing to the Jerusalem area and then traveling up to Constantinople. And then we even talked a little bit about coins on the eyes, which might give a date. Hmm. Of course, my favorite flower has to be this one. It's the one which it starts opening at noon and is fully open by 5.30 so they can estimate when it was picked, which puts it in the afternoon. And like the other flowers on the shroud, it looks like after 24 to 36 hours of wilting, that's when the encoding happened. So we come to new material. The greenish that you see is the first image which came from the VP8 image analyzer in 1978. And that's really what got science super excited and, and active in this business. They realized that, you remember we, we looked at, in fact, I'll show you in a minute, well, uh, the statue they made. And of course they did all that by hand. But then they started working and trying to see if they could smooth it out and make the image a little different. So after a year or so, the blue image arrived and there they had tried to remove the blood clots and things like that to get a, a, a get better sense of what the picture would have looked like. And of course, that's where we especially started to see how the eyes were high and that one cheek is so much higher. Then they decided, okay, well, let's make him a little more human. Let's, let's put some hair on him <laughs> so, and maybe a little bit clearer. And then here you have on the left, of course, the Shroud Man statue that's at the Air Force Academy. But with computers, they've also tried to make it more three-dimensional to see what it would look like in, in this form. A fun one that's been recently publicized starts out this way, and they said, okay, let's age him backwards to see what he might have looked like all the way back to age 12. Interesting how they can do things with computers today that, of course, we wouldn't have been able to do before. And took it one step further and says, well, then maybe this is what Mary would have looked like. Interesting images, right? So if on the left you have the natural image, of course, it, it has to be darkened for the, what we see. And then on the right, you've got the photograph that came out of it being reversed. Then the, taking the photograph and trying to say, okay, what would the person have looked like doing it this way? And I'm gonna try to do something and I'm not sure I can pull it off. Pat, you might be able to yell at me and let me know if it's working. This is a, an attempt to allow you to see the shift between these two images. Is it working? 
Yeah. Works for me. <laughs> okay. I didn't know I could hold it such that I could get it to roll enough with the camera or not. But that's one way to try to see it. Okay, so I have a joke. Two elderly gentlemen were visiting. The first one boasts, I guess we're never too old. Ah, uh, well, just yesterday, a pretty college girl said she was interested in dating me. But to be perfectly honest, I didn't quite understand it. His friend replied, well, you have to remember that today women are more aggressive about dating than when we were young. They don't mind being the one to ask. Well, that's not, well, maybe you uh, remind of her father. No, 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 well, that's not it either. It's just as she also mentioned something about carbon dating. You got it? Okay. And of course, that's the huge misunderstanding about the shroud. From 1982 to 2005, the big misunderstanding, maybe from a research point of view, but of course, publicity wise, it's the big misunderstanding all the way till now. So let's see what we get. Carbon appears in three different possibilities and living items gather carbon-14 while they're alive. But once it dies, then it starts to lose at a half-life rate. Unfortunately, that's a long rate, 5,730 years. But carbon dating occurs by comparing the C12 against the C14 amounts. Not maybe well known most folks, generally is that there's a lot of error in this. They've had living snails to be dated as 26,000 years old, or a newly killed seal, 1,300 years old, or one-year-old leaves have been dated 400 years old, or a 26,000-year-old mammoth, only 5,600 years. And in 1999, something got dated into the future. Uh, Sometimes the bone tools are different from the, the thing that's around them, which doesn't make any sense. Egyptian mummies date older than the cloth they're wrapped in. And a 650 year error is not a, an uncommon kind of problem. Now, if you're doing soil and stuff like that, that's no big deal. But obviously for certain kinds of objects, like a shroud, that, that is a major thing. You get an example of the Ibis, a sacred bird to the Egyptians, and you have 550 years difference between the bird and the wrapping, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So in 1982, we had an unofficial carbon dating. This is a case where someone from the 1978 inspection of the shroud had a single thread, and they decided, let's carbon date the thing. Well, one end came out of 200 AD, and the other end came out of 1000 AD. Well, that I'll tell you right off, <laughs> there's some great concern here. The conclusion that we would draw, of course, from that is you better be real careful when you try to carbon date this thing. Well, Dr. Rossman, who was involved in it, suddenly didn't want to talk about what had been done anymore nor did Caltech, with the result that William Meacham <laughs> put out a book with a most fascinating title of his opinion as to what had just happened. Wow. So understanding that having happened, when they got to the chance in 1988 to do carbon dating, the STIRP plan was a really elaborate plan designed to have several laboratories, make sure we sample carefully all over this thing somehow. There were going to be the usual documentations, blind samples, everything you would want to have in making a test. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way it happened. When they got in the room, they called a lady in who's a textile expert, who was not familiar with the shroud, and she didn't think there was any particular reason to 
sample all over the shroud. So she finally gave them the place to make the cut. So it was random in that sense. And they managed to hit an area of rewoven and color dyed threads. Hmm. Then they submitted it to only three laboratories. And of course, the difference of one part in a trillion <laughs> makes a huge difference. So of course, any mistake is, is fatal, if you will. Well, three laboratories made their announcement between 1260 and 1390 AD. Well, we now enter into, and you notice I have my backgrounds in gray. That's the way I felt about it. It was 17 years trying to figure out why in the world do we have this one finding that's so different from everything else. So they started trying to come up with ideas. Let's suppose that C14 was taken up in numbers by the fact that it was subjected to various conditions. We know it was irradiated, there was heat, there was water dousing with fire that happened in the 1500s. Maybe something happened. Well, good. A Russian came along and said, okay, I'll do the research with the grant money. Great, okay. And he confirmed, yes, we had that, that exactly happened. And then you see the plot there and behind it, except we then learned he faked the data and he took the grant money and ran. <laughs> so <laughs> after a year or so, that fell through. Well, Dr. Phillips then of Harvard said, well, maybe I can work on this, at least logically. And he thought the encoding process would create C14 uh, from one of two possible ways in flax. And he calculated that maybe an 18% of neutrinos would, uh, bombardments would cause a 1300 sh uh, year shift. So then 1800, Dr. Uh, Ronaldo of France said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I, I've got the equipment and I've got samples and so forth to work with old stuff. So he took an Egyptian cloth, which they were pretty careful and pretty sure about when it dated. And he tried that 18%. He says, no, it's only gonna take 4% because I can shift the thing 4,600 years forward by bombardment. Mm. Then we learned more information. Dr. Sox put out a book early. He was with the Zurich lab and he is anti-authenticity. And he published early. He wasn't part of the group. Then we found out that Harry Gove with the University of Arizona said he was willing to do anything to defeat Stirp. You go, wait a minute. I thought this was about science and dating. And then we've learned the University of Oxford's lab said, uh, well, we did take a bribe <laughs> to try to discredit the shroud. So obviously this was not the best 17 years of my reading. I was not a really happy camper. Thank heavens, finally 2000 came along and between the year 2000, 2005, the information kind of got straightened out. Ray Rogers, a retired chemist who was with the STIRP team originally, who died in 2005, made the first effort. And he says lignin is a complex polymer deposited in the cell walls to make them rigid. So he says, by testing this, the production of thermal, de I'm sorry, produced by thermal decomposition of lignin, a chemical compound in plant material, including flax, vanillin decreases and disappears with time. It's easily detected in medieval stuff but not the old stuff. So he says, using the Ray's number five sample that he had, a determination of the kinetics of vanillin loss suggests the shroud is between 1300 years and 3000 years old. Hmm. Okay, now that's, that's more logical, but it's really a reasonable test, reasonableness test that he's applying. 
He can't tell you necessarily that it's 2,000 years old. Well, then 2005 arrived and two amateurs, Sue Benford and Joseph Marino, are looking at this picture you have in front of you. And you see the right hand four have to do with the three, four, yeah, three labs, although it's actually four pieces of material. And they're saying, as we look at them, they're, they're all lined up side by side. But if you look at the graph of their results on the upper right, they're not like each other. It's kind of weird that something that close together is not giving you approximately the same answer. And they said, you know, if you also look at the digitized false color enhancements, the color in the area where they did the cutting isn't like down through the center of the cloth. So are you sure we haven't sampled the wrong thing? And they point out the fact that the rays piece that had been cut out previously was available to scientists and you could check this. You could look to see, you know, is there something weird about the area where the cut was made? Well, Ray Rogers is down now to two months of life. He's dying of cancer. And he's, <laughs> he admitted, he said, I thought I would put these rookies out in five minutes. So he pulls out his ray sample. He happens to have it. And when he takes out the thread, and he checks it out. He finds it has cotton against the linen. Dyes are on the cotton fibers. And he can even find the gummy connectors between the two pieces of where they put a repair thread together and kept on weaving as if it was all one thing. So at a very minimum, we'd say the carbon dating is voided because it, it has to be resampled and redone at least. How's that for a change? Wow. So thank heavens, 17 years is over and we have a pretty good idea. Yeah, this accounts for why we have such a bum result. Well, not only Ray Rogers is of course dying, but the Stirk people are basically dying. They were at their prime in 1978. That's when they had their doctorates and their national reputations, their international reputations, and they're getting older. So fortunately, a new shroud science group has begun. It started under one name in 2003, and then they switched it to shroud science group in 2005. And that's where we get the 2015 shroud dating methods that are new. And we're going to have three of them, and they're by two gentlemen from Italy. Dr. Fonte did this first one, and I hope I say some of these fancy words right. And Ken, you can nod yes or no. <laughs> it's Fourier, right? <laughs> Fourier transform interfer infrared vibrational specs 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 blah, blah, blah. spectroscopy. There, he uses the concept that fiber polymers degrade over time. And what he finally figured out is how to calibrate it so that he could figure out the degradation and put it into a year format. And so his result that he got from that was past the point, the 29 to 33 AD, which is probably the time the shroud would be used by Jesus of Nazareth, if he's the one involved. He then also, um, Raman, I think is the way it's said, the Raman vibrational analysis. And after he got that calibrated, it has to do with the relationship of the photons hitting the surface under test. And he comes out with that one being mostly past the point in which Jesus of Nazareth would have used the shroud, if involved. Malfi went a different direction. His is not through the microscope and so forth. Rather, his is a, actually a mechanical sort of thing. He had to build a device to be able to do it. A mechanical, multi-parametric dating method in which he's measuring the strength of fibers 
as they slowly disintegrate. And his comes in enough to include 29 to 33 AD, but uh, nearer to today than the other two methods. These three methods combine with a 95% accuracy estimate, would include 33 BC, so that would be quite sufficient for the, the needs of 33 AD that probably would be what Jesus would have used. Okay, characteristics of science number eight. We search for contradictory evidence. Oh, this is a tough one. You've got a scientist who wants to publish, and he's asked, do a serious search for things that will disprove what you're trying to prove. So you've got to look at all the possibilities to see if there anything you've left out. You're going to put your neck out on a limb. Are you sure that you're not missing something? Now think about what he's being asked to do here. His chance to publish is going to hang on this. His chance to get more grant money is going to hang on this. The money maybe in his pockets going, for salary is going to rest on his recognition and his profession. I mean, all this. And you're asking him to disprove what he just tried to prove. Hmm, that's quite a, that's quite a challenge. So I'm going to try some just to show you how this works. Uh, 1997, a book called The Second Messiah. The theory is that a real man was crucified in the 1250s. So Shroud Man actually did live and was crucified. And he put his image on a shroud. And it's exactly what the carbon dating found. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, it's intriguing because the victim that they're talking about survived and was seen on a public balcony the following day, which is rather exciting given the medical examiners and what they think happened to the person. It's also intriguing from, shall we say, a historical point of view, in the thousands of people we've called Roman Catholics are really Jewish, as, such as St. Patrick as an example. And of course, it doesn't remotely fit the science evidence that we said was required. So here, I, as the person who wants to publish, I'm going to reject an alternative explanation that's anti-authenticity. Second possibility is a 1994 book by Picnic and Prince. They present the theory that Leonardo da Vinci made the shroud by photography. This is fascinating because the shroud was known before he was born and he died before photography. Ah, to make that one work, you had to have a shroud first. <laughs> he had to invent photography, make the replacement shroud, switch him, and never tell anyone that he invented photography. That's a rather intriguing approach. It's based on a secret informant. He uses painted on blood. And of course, once again, it doesn't remotely take the science information we know into account. Here again, I'm rejecting an alternative explanation that's anti-authenticity. Now, this is one of these books that's both a blessing and a curse. And I raise that as a person who deals with the shroud. The curse part of it is I hate to spend money to buy stuff that once I look through it a little bit, I realize this is going to be a piece of junk. The blessing part of it is it makes you struggle with thoughts you might not have struggled with otherwise. And so from that point of view, yeah, I end up I buy this stuff, and but I, I often regret <laughs> the amount of money that I put into it. Third possibility is the book Resurrection, Resurrected in the year 2000. It had great facts and information up to one point, and that's where the man says, I think the resurrection was a photograph when it was an upright, flat shroud to get it to work out. Hmm. Well, that doesn't take into account the blurs. And it sounds like that's not going to work at all. So here I'm rejecting something that is pro-authenticity, but it doesn't seem like the mechanisms quite work out right. A fourth example I could take is pollen information. 
We already talked about that. How we have so much pollen from Palestine, then some from Odessa, it's then moving through Turkey up to Constantinople, and then finally four in Europe. I've always been surprised that there's no olive tree pollens in the list. You know, when I think of Israel, I think of olive trees. They seem to be a major fruit there. Now, I do realize that when you look up the material that was used in the threads, it isn't limited in growth to the area of Palestine. And in fact, it may not come from Palestine. So there may be an explanation that it was growing someplace nearby and the Hebrews brought it in and did the, the weaving or whatever, and that would account for it. But this is what, again, this is what a scientist should be taking into account is what doesn't seem to fit. I told you previously that my fifth example is one where there's a man says, I don't think the space of desktop is where the nail went through. I think it's going to be called the Z area. And I told you even then, that I thought probably there will be a revision someday in the understanding of the spot. The effect is the same and the pain would be the same. So from one point of view, it's not a big deal, but it, it shows the kind of thing. And then the final one I'll take is the results, the probabilistic um, model. MathCAD 7 was used. We're up to MathCAD 14. If you look up, say, like in Wikipedia, they talk about the problems of MathCAD 7. And there was a problem in how it handled paren A plus B close paren times C under certain conditions. Those may never have happened in this calculation. And they also talk about the fact that because of the being taken over by another company, the changes that were requested by users didn't make it to the programmers in MathCAD 7. So my question I would have as a very careful scientist would be, do we need to rerun that calculation in a newer MathCAD version, just to be sure we still have the same authenticity answer. So this is the kind of thing that you would do in your eighth characteristic of science. Ninth characteristics of science, replication to verify. Mm. Let's see, what are we gonna ask? Someone to volunteer? Be the person to climb into a shroud and we're going to try to do to you the same thing that we think happened to this poor guy. Uh, well, when we usually think of this particular characteristic, we think of images like this about what you do with, you know, microscopes and so forth and taking notes and all that. But the real issue is to verify. It's not to replicate. So if there's a way you can verify it, that's useful without making it necessarily replicating the exact same experience. And it seems odd, but there is actually a device that we could use for replication with the shroud. It's called the sudarium. It's going to help us look at the blood issues, the positions, but there's no, no image on this particular cloth. Mark Guskin is the person who's kind of led the charge in the books and so forth on this particular item. It was customary for the Jewish people to cover the face or the head of someone who had died out of respect or they're carrying them or they're doing the burial anointing. anointing. Um, especially, they said, with injury. But of course, we do the same sort of thing with people as we have dead people, we cover their faces, don't we? Uh, when you think of the morticians and when you think of everything else, we tend to cover the genital area. I mean, we, we have some sense of respect that we, we use too. We're talking about a piece of cloth that's about 33 by 21 inches. It's had its own research done over the years. They say 6,000 uh, experiments that they've done. And on the right side, you see the reconstruction of how they think the wrap was on the head. Some of the parts 
are multi-layered, but where the cheek was down on the shoulder, they don't have any cloth covering the head at that point. I'm going to show you some extra images along the way. Um, if you see the dark lines around the stains, that course was drawn on. And they're trying to figure out how this would fit with the face of the person who was on the cross. There are two reports. I'm using the 1999 to kind of guide putting this one together. But the person was clearly dead. He was wounded before death on the scalp, neck, shoulders, and part of the upper back. Of course, the cloth didn't go down past that point. He appears to have a beard, mustache, long hair tied in a ponytail pattern at the nape of the neck. Now they're doing this from stains, so there's no encoded image like the shroud itself. It seemed to be an extreme swelling as he was dying. He appears to have had his arms upward, so the death is certainly compatible with death on the cross. You have one part blood to six part water, which would certainly make sense. Appears that the cloth was removed from his head, probably at the destination is the guess. An adult male, normal size, mix, matches the neck wound pattern of the shroud. Has the same weave and texture as the shroud. Has most of the pollens found on the shroud. And almost all the pollens come from the Jerusalem area. Now, descriptively, they said, the fluid came out of the nostrils when it seemed to be in an upright position, when it seemed to be moving about an hour later, and when it was flat about 45 minutes after that. And they're looking at the pattern of how it dried. Well, now, interpretively, remember, remember you, you guys and gals, we're trying to make sure we're, we're separate here between <laughs> what we see and then what we interpret. So they think maybe while on the cross and then about an hour later while being brought down off the cross and then about 45 minutes after that while on the ground. Are you ready for what I'm going to do? Mm, Joe is going to have some fun here. And this is strictly me, this is not in print. But if this story has, is going to make sense, here's what's got to fit. So let's see. Three o'clock apparently was the time of the death. And 5.30 was the light up time where they had to have all work cease. And so the body had to be in the tomb and they rolled the stone shut. At three o'clock, you have JOA, Joseph of Arimathea, is to request the body. And JOA and Anne, Joseph of, of Arimathea and Nicodemus, are involved in the burial. We have Mary and disciple John at the cross. And we have some women that probably are the ones who went out and picked the flowers because the disciples disappeared. Remember, that, that they didn't stick around. <laughs> Seemed to be a lot of fear involved. So this is kind of the framework in which we're going to work to see, can we make sense of all this? So let's say about 320, it became obvious that Jesus was dead. And maybe around 330, they put the covering on his head. And by this time, in the request has been made to Pilate. And Pilate, then has to certify he's dead. So the back someone goes and tells someone, you confirm that he's dead so I can release the body. And the lance is stuck into his heart to confirm, yep, he's dead. That would be the first jolt and the first amount to come out of his nose to then dry on the sudarium. Maybe around 410, Pilate, okay, you can take him down, Joseph of Arimathea. And so they get the process of getting him down off the cross, have to unnail his feet, and bring him down. At this point, maybe an hour has gone by from the point of him being certified by a Roman soldier, yes, 
he's dead. When they get him down, the bringing down part gets the second discharge from his nose. Around 440, they get his hands unnailed and they begin to carry him and they've got to take him some distance to get him to the tomb. Around 520, they've reached, say, the point of the, uh, <laughs> my brain dead, of the, of the <laughs> path, I went brain dead, <laughs> the point of the tomb, here we go, and they have to force him at the door, force his arms at the door in order to get him tied properly. What do I mean by that? Well, arriving at the tomb, they've got to get him through a very small hole. And yes, it's true, rigor mortis is our usual stiffening that we think of upon death. And we usually think of it, you know, four, six hours, something like that, that's going to set in. But there's also a spasm that's instantaneous. And under violent death, extreme physical situation, intention, intense emotion, I think he qualifies on all that. But yeah, that may well account for it. And what is happening here, they're having to force his arms down and in to get them tied together to get him into the shroud. They're running out of time, but they still have some time in there to put the three bands, one around his jaw, to keep his mouth closed, one around his wrists, one around his ankles. You can pack some alos around him. You can put the coins on the eyes. You can put the flowers around him. And you can still make it out the door by 530 and roll the stone in place. Why this, this, this pattern? Well, we know from the shroud work, you have to have the dead person within the shroud in two and a half hours. Now, if he died at 2.30 and then you have him there by five, that works, just so it's two and a half hours. What we know from scripture and what we know from the darkness that covered the area, more than just Palestine, it's recorded, had darkness. The um, earthquake, the splitting of the uh, curtain in the temple, three o'clock seems to be the best time to understand that happening. And of course, the temple demanded at 5.30, the light up time they called it, you had to stop all work. And they were so strict that at the point where they're trying to get ready, if his jaw is open, you cannot pull his jaw closed and then put the thing around his head. You can tie it where it is, but you can't work. You can't tie, tie it tighter. Um, you can hold his arms in place, but you can't force his arms into place. That's work. If his eyes are open, you can't do anything. But if his eyes are closed, you could put a coin on it to keep them closed. They're very, very strict rules that they had about what happened when a person died. So as you can see, this has been quite exciting to try to get all this accomplished within the framework of time. The fingers that held the cloth to the nose as he was being transported are clear, but no fingerprints exist. The prints, however, permit an exact measurement of the nose, and it does equal the size of the shroud nose. They found a small stain at the right side of the mouth, and after that, they decided to go back to the shroud, and they looked if they could find that. They found the blood type is AB, the same as a shroud, and all the tests that have been done so far are identical with shroud blood. There were 70 feature congruences of the blood with the shroud face. There were 50 feature congruences of blood with the shroud at the back of the neck and the head. As I say, they had two different studies that have been done. So where did this cloth go? Well, apparently it stayed around Jerusalem until 614 AD. And then when the Persian army was coming in, it was taken across to Alexandra and then Cartagena. Then it was moved to Toledo, Spain. 
And then some years later, the Toledo bishop, for whatever reason, was moving, and he went to Oviedo, and that's where it still remains, in a chest. And three times a year, they bring this particular sudarium out for events. So at a very minimum, we'd have to say it, the, the sudarium pretty much says the shroud's got to exist in its current appearance from 761 AD, which is a whole lot earlier than the carbon-14 dating, which, as I've said, is the flawed dating. Wow. Now, I'm going to do a, maybe a historical point. This is just for fun. No, no extra charge. I'm throwing this in extra. You, you probably realize the upper left picture was the high priest in the Hebrew religion. And you probably know the lower right picture is modern day headgear for the Roman Catholic clergy. And you can see the pattern across to the 11th century and then it gets a real point to it. And then thereafter it gets even more pointed as we have the years go by. There is tradition that Simon Peter put the sudarium on his head at one point when he was kind of, I guess, officiating or something. And while apparently no one else, at least no one's been reported else, has taken up that practice since then, wonder maybe if the nuns in their practice of headgear have taken up that same pattern too. That certainly would have been a very interesting headgear to have on Simon Peter when he was doing that. Maybe after he was uh, crucified, no one really wanted to pick up that practice anymore, or maybe the leadership of the church had changed. But at any rate, this is maybe an historical point. Not heavily documented, but just enough to say, eh, 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 maybe there's something to it. So, we've had a verification, not by replication, but by having a comparative kind of thing to go against it. Ms. Pat, at this point, I think it would be a good time for me to break for the evening. There is no way to get the next one accomplished. And so we will time it such that the next one, which is really a good one, can all be put together at the same time. What, what we're doing next, we're still staying with science, but we're moving into something of trying the most recent experiments and trying to come to the point of saying, maybe this is how you account for what we see as a grand hypothesis before we actually leave the science realm. 